So thanks, Andreas. My name is Colin Blake from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I work on the, the NUID spectrograph as well as the Minerva project, and I've been very interested in telluric lines and a number of applications uh, for, for many years. So today I'm going to talk to you about the impact of telluric lines on EPRV measurements specifically. Um, now, I'm sure we can all agree that Earth's atmosphere is fantastic, right? It, play, it provides a great place for us all to live, makes lovely sunsets. Um, but as ground-based astronomers, there are a number of problems that we have to deal with every day in our work related to absorption by Earth's atmosphere. So if you look at a spectrum of absorption by Earth's atmosphere, it looks something like this from the optical out into the infrared. And as you can see, once you get to wavelengths longer than about 0.6 microns, there are numerous kind of clusters of molecular absorption features. There are many water features, but there are also features due to molecular oxygen, broad features due to ozone, there's CO2, there's CH4, um, and as you go to longer wavelengths, there are, are many other different types of absorbers. So you can see that when you're looking at red wavelengths, you're going to have to be dealing with absorption by Earth's atmosphere. Sometimes these absorption features are really quite strong. I'm going to talk primarily about water today because I think um, from the point of view of EPRV, water is, is probably the most challenging thing for us to deal with. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is that the water lines themselves are quite numerous. Water is everywhere. So the lines are quite numerous. They span a really wide range of depths. Um, and they also change all the time in depth, which I'll talk about in a bit. Here's just a zoom in of absorption by Earth's atmosphere around 800 and say 23 nanometers. These are water absorption features, and this is a spectrum, absorption spectrum you would get for some sort of typical um, astronomical observatory, maybe three kilometers altitude and, and sort of typical uh, weather conditions or amount of water vapor. So the water lines themselves, they have at this altitude, they have a width of about 0.01 nanometer. So that means that for your average EPRV spectrometer, they're marginally resolved, which can be helpful and also can be a problem. The line shapes, in detail, of course, these are, are void profiles or potentially something even more complicated. But because water is primor uh, primarily in the lower atmosphere where the pressure is relatively high, these are very well approximated by a um, Lorentzian shape. And the water lines, they do come in these bands. And within these bands, you tend to find about 10 to 40 lines per nanometer of spectrum having depths greater than about 1%. Now, if you were to zoom in, you would see that there are very many shallower water lines, the so-called micro telluric. So if you're worried about absorption at the less than 1% level, it really even becomes more true that water is everywhere. So one of the main problems with water, as I mentioned, is that it's highly variable. As we all know, the amount of water vapor in our atmosphere is changing all the time, and that's illustrated here. These are two high-resolution spectra at around one micron of a hot star. So a featureless uh, star that's kind of acting like a backlight for Earth's atmosphere. So all of the absorption features you see here are due to water. And you can see these are two spectra taken like a few hours apart that the amount of water vapor is changing substantially. And that means that the depths of the lines, the optical depths of the lines are changing a lot. So of course, the line depth depends a lot on air mass because that's the quantity or path length through Earth's atmosphere. But it also depends on something we call precipitable water vapor which is measured in millimeters. And at an excellent observing site, that quantity could be something like a, a millimeter. So water vapor varies a lot. Other species less so. Obviously, you know, thankfully for us, molecular oxygen is not changing by 25% within a night. I think that would have detrimental effects on our, our well-being, but water vapor is definitely changing quite a bit. That's illustrated here. This is a plot that shows the histogram of the change in this so-called precipitable water vapor number within a night at Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. Um, you can see that it's quite common to have a change of, of half a millimeter or more within a night. So the bottom line here is that 25% changes in water line depths within a night are very, very common. It's something we're going to have to deal with for EPRVs. So you can sort of begin to imagine how this will be a big problem. Remember, the fundamental issue we're trying to address here is we're observing some star at high resolution, and we're trying to measure incredibly subtle shifts in the centers of stellar absorption features. That's shown in black here. But superimposed on that is Earth's atmosphere. So that's an absorber that's changing in depth with time. But then because Earth is going around the sun, there's also an effect where the lines are moving relative to each other. So this is a, a difficult problem. That's kind of illustrated here in this little simulation, right? So the telluric water is red, 
a G star is black. And you can see that as Earth goes around the sun, there's a very complicated mixing here. And you can easily imagine how this could, this could cause big problems in trying to measure stellar radio velocities. There's been a lot of nice work in the literature on this, which I, I wanted to kind of summarize. Um, some work related to simulating the RV impact. Um, There's a really great paper by Kuhn et al. in 2014, um, simulating the impact of these telluric lines um, in HARPS data. And these are simulations that fix precipitable water vapor, but different air mass. And they've taken the step of just masking out the, the truly egregious lines, the very, very deep lines. Um, and what you can see here is a function of barycentric velocity on the x-axis, there is a, a somewhat large RV bias. So telluric lines are biasing the RV measure at the sort of between a half and maybe a meter a second level. This is problematic. Um, there's a recent paper by, by Sharon, who we, who we heard from, um, I guess, on the first day of the, of the conference. Um, a recent paper by Sharon and collaborators looking primarily at the iodine region. So there are not particularly deep lines in the iodine region, but there are water lines you can see here in red. And then just at the edge of this region in blue, you can see that there is an oxygen band. Um, Sharon concluded that these telluric lines are important as we seek to go between below two meters a second in this iodine region. And she investigated some different techniques for mitigating these lines, masking them, trying to model them out. Um, and she found that modeling actually works quite well. So with a, a modeling approach, you can almost recover the precision you would expect had the telluric lines not been there at all. Again, this is in the iodine region. This is a nice plot from simulations by Natasha Latouf. This was done in preparation for the Earthfinder probe study. Um, and here she's looking at the expected RV bias in the no mitigation regime. So we're doing nothing about these telluric lines at all. So the telluric spectrum from the optical to the infrared is shown in red. And then the expected RV error induced by just these lines themselves is traced out in blue here. Again, it looks like in the optical you can do reasonably, you can do reasonably well. Maybe there are certain regimes in which you can just ignore these lines. But as you start to get to the infrared, it essentially becomes catastrophic. There are tiny little regions where you might hope to work. These are familiar to us as you know, maybe the J, H, K, or Y, or Z observing bands. But in the general case, these telluric lines are gonna be super problematic and, and could in, you know, induce hundreds of meters a second in RV uncertainty. So the question becomes, what are we gonna do about this? One option is nothing. And I think there are certain wavelength regimes and certain science cases where this may be reasonable. Um, for example, if a 50 centimeters a second RV uncertainty due to water lines is acceptable in the optical, that's fine. But keep in mind is that as we move toward the red edge of the optical, say 700 to 900 nanometers, the telluric water lines themselves become much more numerous and also and they become deeper. And that's unfortunate because those wavelength regions are particularly valuable for observations of low mass stars, right? M stars have a lot of photons out there. So ignoring the telluric lines in that wavelength regime, probably not possible. And PRVs, I think in the infrared at wavelengths longer than a micron, again, with the possible exception of some narrow regions that ha happen to be just sort of devoid of lines, they're probably not gonna be possible without some sort of mitigation strategy. So one strategy, and this is something that has been applied profitably uh, over the years, is you simply mask the telluric lines during your analysis. This is viable, I would say, in parts of the optical, but it starts to become problematic in the near infrared. And again, that's because the lines start to become very numerous in the near infrared. So to account for the barycentric motion of the Earth, you probably want to mask out a region around each of these telluric lines. And that's kind of illustrated here at the bottom. So imagine we have a, a bit of spectrum around 700 nanometers and we're gonna mask out around the telluric lines. And if you wanna excise a region that corresponds to Earth's barycentric motion, you have to excise these relatively large green chunks. So you're losing a lot of spectrum. And obviously we don't wanna do that. There are much more clever ways to do this masking. I'll draw your attention to two examples here, Artigal and another paper by Ansgar Liners uh, for a discussion of more efficient ways to do this. But again, in the, in the near infrared, there are just so many of these lines that it becomes difficult to mask. Another thing you could do is you could try to correct the spectrum. This is an idea that goes way back in astronomy, right? The idea that I'm gonna observe my science target with telluric lines superimposed on that spectrum. And then I'm gonna point my telescope to some telluric standard, a hot star, similar in air mass, close in time. 
And then in some way, I'm gonna correct that science spectrum. Maybe I'm gonna divide it out. And that correction, it could be an empirical observation, right? I'm gonna observe a hot star, but remember that takes very valuable telescope time, so that's not ideal. Or it could be a, a calculated transmission model of Earth's atmosphere. So this is kind of illustrated here at the bottom. You have a spectrum that's highly contaminated with telluric absorption on top. You have your telluric absorption on model, uh, model in the middle, and you're gonna sort of divide the top by the middle to get a correction. There are other more recent examples in the literature. This has been done um, nicely, I'd say, with, with cryo-res data at very high resolution. Again, there are regimes where this can work uh, fairly well. So you could observe a hot star that takes telescope time. You could also try to calculate uh, a transmission model of Earth's atmosphere. That would involve a radiated transfer calculation. So the basic idea is that as a function of wavelength, you want to calculate the total optical depth through Earth's atmosphere. So you need a list of lines, molecular transitions. Usually we use what's called the HITRAN database. So you need a model of Earth's atmosphere, pressure, temperature versus elevation, maybe wind. You need some information about the line shape. And you're going to break Earth's atmosphere up into layers. And then essentially, again, you're just going to add optical depth as a function of wavelength across all these layers and then calculate your atmospheric transmission this way. There are a lot of great codes that do this. Um, some examples, just quickly, TAPAS, TerraSpec, LBL, RTM, TELFIT, MOLECFIT. And in general, for lines of what I would call moderate optical depth, uh, the agreement is quite good. So there are a lot of nice examples in the literature where you have an observation of a hot star, you over, overlay a, a calculated model, and the agreement is, is quite good, a percent or a couple of percent, maybe. There have been examples of situations where there seem to be discrepancies between um, the high trend input parameters um, and the observed telluric spectrum. Um, but it's really important to keep in mind that the high trend database is always being updated. So we want to make sure we're using the most recent line lists. Now, as we go to stronger and stronger telluric lines, in general, the agreement between our calculated model and what we observe on the sky is going to get worse. And part of that has to do with the fact that we're maybe not treating the, the wings of the line exactly correctly in our calculation. But I would argue that this is not such a big obstacle because let's face it, if you have a, a water absorption line or a series of water absorption lines that have depths of 75%, we're probably not gonna be extracting radio velocities from that underlying spectrum. And again, I did want to mention that there occasionally are examples of missing lines, let's say, in the high trend database. In the lower left here, there's an example but I wanted to highlight that for our purposes, these high trend line values, particularly for water, are very good and they're very close to complete for the line strengths we care about. Another thing I wanted to point out about the empirical uh, correction kind of approach is that there's a mathematical assumption in here that, that that's not correct. So imagine that I have an astronomical spectrum, my data. That's the stellar spectrum times the telluric spectrum convolved with the spectrograph line spectrum. And then I'm going to try to correct my data by dividing that by the convolution of a telluric model and the spectrograph line square function. But mathematically, that, that's not correct, right? I'm not correctly recovering the, stellar, the underlying stellar spectrum uh, using this approach. And Sharon mentioned this in her talk as well. Um, she has a nice upcoming paper where she explores kind of quantitatively what the impact of this assumption is. I did want to mention that this approximation is probably less bad at higher spectral resolution. So as I go from 50,000 to 150,000 to 200,000 resolution, both my telluric lines and my stellar lines are going to be resolved. So in the limit where they're both very well resolved, this is actually maybe not such a bad uh, approximation, but it's always going to be worse when the telluric line density is very high, when I have many lines per nanometer of spectrum, and that's because the lines mix in a very complicated way. And again, that's the case in the near infrared. So the fourth option, and I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for this in the community, is sort of a full-on forward modeling approach. So is it possible to simultaneously moder model my stellar spectrum and my telluric spectrum, whatever I need to know but don't really care about, about the spectrograph while inferring RV? Um, there's a great paper going down this direction uh, describing a co code named Wobble. Uh, by Megan Bedell et al, published in 2019. Um, you can see an example from that here on the left where we have observations of 51 peg B 
Um, this analysis has been carried out to derive a telluric model, a star model, um, as well as the radial velocities. I also want to mention um, another approach, a, a sort of semi-empirical forward model that includes a lot of the physics that we know about Earth's atmosphere and also these line transitions by Ashley Baker, also published in 2019. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about the, these techniques, these forward modeling techniques, is that they probably require a lot of data, um, and more specifically, a wide range of barycentric velocity. Uh, these methods are, are particularly powerful where you have Earth's motion resulting in a separation of the telluric lines and the stellar lines in time. So if you just had one or two spectra that you really wanted to derive velocities from, this is probably an approach that, you know, that might not work for you. And at the same time, again, this is more complicated in the near infrared because you lose that advantage. When you have a lot, a lot of telluric lines, you lose the advantage of separation due to barycentric motion. So when I think about telluric lines, there, there are three questions that come up that come to mind. One is, you know, how are we going to determine the spectrum of telluric water absorption in our spectrum? Are we gonna use theoretical models? Are we gonna use machine learning approach? Are we gonna use on-sky data? The second question is, what are you gonna do with that information? So let's say you had an observation of your favorite star and I handed you the perfect telluric model corresponding to the atmosphere at that time. What would you do with it? And then third, as I sort of alluded to in the last couple of slides, is should we be fully forward modeling all of our spectra to help us understand both what the star is doing, what the instrument is doing, and what Earth's atmosphere is doing. Some takeaways for me, thinking about this topic over the years, is that there's a lot of knowledge and or data that we can use related to both Earth's atmosphere as well as molecular transition. The HITRAN database at the line strengths that we care about is essentially complete and accurate. So this idea that we don't have sufficient molecular transition information to address this problem is, is not really right. But it's important to use the most recent version of, of HITRAN. It's constantly being updated, and, and folks who are involved in HITRAN are always working, are working hard on it. And in my experience, they're very happy to talk to us about these issues. There's a lot of enthusiasm for full-up modeling codes like Wobble, um, but also for hybrid approaches that are both data-driven and involve some of this atomic and molecular physics and atmospheric physics that we can take advantage of. But I think it's a bit of an open question of how well these techniques will extend out to the near infrared where the telluric lines are, are super numerous. There's a lot of appeal to completely empirical approaches, right? When I describe the calculation of uh, an atmospheric transmission model, I talked about summing optical depth over layers of Earth's atmosphere as a function of wavelength. When I think of summing optical depth, something like principal component analysis comes immediately to mind. And there's been some really nice work on this. Uh, the Spiru team, um, paper by Art de Gau et al. in 2014, and this beautiful plot showing a correction of relatively deep, right, tens of percent uh, telluric lines here and getting quite good results using kind of data-driven linear models. Similar to that, a very nice uh, code called Selenite by, by Lee et al. 2019. Again, this is an approach where you have a number of observations at a range of barycentric velocities, and you're deriving the underlying telluric spe uh, spectrum. Uh, this approach is nice in that it's very fast, it's totally empirical, and it naturally handles different absorbing species. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested. And again, as I've alluded to, I, I think we can all agree that this problem is going to be much harder in the near infrared. So this is a bit of the H-band. This is where the SDSS apogee spectrum, spectrograph operates. And you can see it's, it's kind of a morass, right? We have H2O, we've got very densely packed CO2 lines, there's, there's um, methane mixed in there. So you have high line density, you have line mixing, um, and maybe the CH4 parameters, um, maybe to a lesser extent the CO2 parameters are not maybe as well understood as the water lines in our atomic uh, databases. So I think in the infrared, this is, a, this is a big problem. And of course, there's also strong sky emission, which I haven't addressed really uh, here at all, but you know, superimposed across this entire wavelength range, there are very strong OH emission features. So when I talk to people about telluric lines and the impact of these absorption features on EPRVs, I do feel optimism because there's a lot of physics here that we understand. There's a lot of great work that's been done by our colleagues in different departments, in physics departments, in, uh, in atmospheric sciences departments um, that we can use, to, to, we can leverage to help us solve this problem. And I think it's fair to say that there are an array of sophisticated analysis techniques that we talk about and lots of people are excited about, but we're kind of just starting to explore these techniques. So I'm really hopeful that there are people here listening 
um, young scientists who will get involved in this topic and help us solve some of these problems. In conclusion, I just wanted to kind of bring it back to Ch Chad mentioned on the very first day, uh, some of the history of EPRVs. And I love this paper from 1973. This is Griffin and Griffin talking about making precise radio velocity measurements of stars at the 10 meter a second level. And the proposal was to use telluric oxygen lines in the optical as a simultaneous reference, sort of in a way similar to the iodine cell has been used. But this is for 10 meters a second. And today we're aiming for more than 100 times better. So we've moved from talking about using these telluric lines in the 1970s to our advantage to talking about trying to mitigate them to an incredibly low level to help us achieve centimeters a second type velocities. So in conclusion, I, I think it's fair to say that telluric lines may be a leading source of systematic error in the optical as we go below 50 centimeters a second, um, and at least a few meters a second in most of the near infrared. But I think we have a lot of tools at our disposal to help deal with this problem. Um, and for me, given all the talented students and postdocs I've had the opportunity to talk to about this topic, I, I'm optimistic and I fully expect this problem uh, to be solved. I just hope that's before I retire. All right, thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks a lot. Um, great presentation and a few questions are there. Um, one question asks about what is a moderate optical depth? And I take this as also meaning what really um, yeah, distinguishes weak lines from strong lines and the differences in their treatment. That's a, a great question. So one problem sort of intrinsic to water is that that'll change depending on the day or the time of year. You know, because we can have order a few changes in the water optical depth during like otherwise reasonable observing conditions. You know, the line that's 5% today could be 20% next month or, ne or next season. Um, so the issue is, well, a couple of things. One is that as the lines get deeper, you're simply losing stellar photons. So at some point, these lines are gonna absorb away so many of your photons that it's not really worth trying to do science at the, those wavelengths. But it's also fair to say that as the depth increases, you have to be able to model or understand that line to a much, much higher precision. Because if I have any sort of residual uncertainty in my model of what that line should look like, that's gonna have a much larger impact on the derived RVs if the line itself um, is deep. So I think about lines of depths of up to a, a few percent, let's say, water lines in the optical as being things that we um, should very easily be able to deal with. In fact, masking probably works well right there. Um, but as we move to this red optical, say 700 to 900 nanometers, we're dealing with much deeper lines, 20, 30 percent. Um, and I think there, that's the regime in which some of these new approaches will be most powerful. And that's also the wavelength regime in which the spectrum is worth a lot for observations of envelopes. So I think that's an important area to focus. Thanks. There's another question regarding and kind of the math behind describing these um, processes. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, the starlight passing through the atmosphere is described by a multiplication. So you star and tellurics is a multiplication. Mm -hmm. And then the detection means convolution with the instrumental profile. So again, how um, does this hang together and um, why do you use convolutions and multiplications to describe these? Yeah, so, so fundamentally Earth's atmosphere um, is absorbing photons. So that's a multiplicative effect, right? I have some optical depth at some wavelength, and e to the minus that number is gonna give me the transmission for this atmosphere. So I multiply my stellar spectrum times my transmission model, where transmission goes from zero to one, where one is full transmission. Then when I observe, when I record that spectrum, optically that uh, product is going to be broadened by what we call the line spread function of the, the spectrograph. There are optical effects there that mean I put a monochromatic light source into my spectrograph. Um, what comes out the other side is going to be broader. Right? There's like a transfer function. Um, now, as I get to very, very high spectral resolution, like imagine I have spectral resolution of a million. I have an FTS, a Fourier transform spectrometer observation of the sun. The effect of that convolution in the instrument 
actually starts to become much, much less important, right? If I have a, a well-resolved stellar line that I'm convolving by a delta function, the result is going to be that well-resolved stellar line. So that division process is not as bad as I go to very, very high spectral resolution. But most astronomical spectrometers for PRBs are going to be in the 100,000 to maybe 200,000 uh, range. And that's kind of right at the border where the telluric lines themselves are well resolved or, or not. Um, so it's particularly problematic, I would say, in that, in that regime. Good. Um, here's an interesting question regarding um, telluric emission. How is that okay. different from absorption and what is the different treatment? Right, okay, so I just mentioned just, just briefly uh, telluric emission. So um, if you've ever seen an infrared spectrum, say um, an, a, a lowish resolution spectrum of a, of a star, a slit spectrum um, in the infrared, uh, like from carbon X, for example, you, you would notice that as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, you see very bright emission features up to the point where there's so many of these emission features that they all sort of blend together. And many of those emission features are due to OH, hydroxyl radicals, high up in our atmosphere. Um, and those change a huge amount in time. You know, I don't know, uh, Andreas, you have a good feeling for the sort of temporal autocorrelation for the emission changes, but I think they can change by a factor of a few in like minutes or something like this. Yeah, it's um, pretty much just a few minutes. A few minutes. And the amount of flux can be amazingly large in some of these lines, up to the point where they can you know, really drown out your, your spectrum, particularly if it's a fainter star. Um, so in the optical, thankfully, we don't have to worry as much about sky emission, although we do have to worry about scattered um, you know, sunlight off the moon and things like this. But in the infrared, I think that the OH emission line and how to deal with those features that are superimposed on top of your spectrum, as well as scattered light from those features, is probably a, a major issue, um, which people in common as and HPF and IRD are, are, are working hard on. Mm -hmm. Another question regards the method of determining this. Can you just use a hot star? Yeah, so I think to first approximation, yes. So you could start with an observation of a hot star. So let's say, you know, I, I observe you know, my, my favorite exoplanet hosting star, and then immediately I go to an A star, a hot star that's right nearby, and I get a telluric spectrum. That's going to give you a, a very good model of what Earth's atmosphere is doing a few minutes after your observation of your science target. Um, I think the question then, though, becomes, what, what are you going to do with that information? So that will help you identify the telluric lines, certainly, right? If you just want to mask the telluric lines out, then that will help you uh, identify those telluric lines, but I would argue you could have calculated that from the get-go. So I think at that point, all you've really done is used some observing time and you could have been observing uh, science targets. Um, I think there could be some, some very exciting and interesting analysis approaches which would uh, somehow use that spectrum as the seed or the starting point for a forward model that would help you, you know, analyze your science spectrum to get out the telluric model and what the star's doing, what the spectrograph's doing. So I think there are probably very interesting avenues, um, avenues there. Yeah. Okay. So one final question um, regarding the um, Doppler motions or broadening induced by motions in the Earth atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Is that important or do you just have to account for changing line depths? So, yeah. So the, the, the water, okay. So telluric water lines are, are, um, are Lorentzian in shape, right? They're in the lower atmosphere below the tropopause, so below about 12 or 13 kilometers. Um, and uh, there the, the pressure broadening is quite important. Um, as you go up to higher altitudes in Earth's atmosphere, the density drops a lot. Um, and the sort of Doppler broadening becomes more important. So for CO2 lines and oxygen lines, uh, the assumption that they're, that they're Lorentzian, that their pressure broadening is not, is not quite right. So if you wanted to model CO2 lines in the infrared, you would have to take this into account. Um, one thing that could matter is that the widths of the lines, the water lines are pressure dependent. So if you wanted to get into the, the real details of calculating theoretical transmission models, the widths of those lines at a given observatory, the water lines will change with time um, because of changes in barometric 
Um, I think it's probably the case that for EPRVs, that's a higher order effect that doesn't matter as much as just the simple fact that you have a low level absorber that's rostering, rostering back and forth against the star due to barycentric motion. But certainly, mm -hmm. yes, the line depths and the line shapes and the line widths are changing due to a variety of atmospheric effects on you know, all time scales. Yeah, and the Doppler shift induced by wind certainly matters a lot if you want to use them as references, as in this reference that you show, showed by um, Griffin. Um, so if you use them as the radio velocity standard, then the Doppler shift plays a big role, but not so much for the subtraction. That's right. There's a very nice plot in a paper by uh, using HARPS data by uh, Pedro Figueira showing the measurement of the oxygen lines relative to the HARPS wavelength reference as a function of wind patterns. So that's sort of a 10-ish meter a second type effect. Yeah. So thanks a lot. And, um, Thank you.